Often you'll hear someone say, well, it's all in the stars, as if it's all preordained. Now, that's, according to me, not true. Everything isn't preordained. But we can tell a lot by the stars. We know that. There are people, for example, who plant their vegetables and vineyards according to the cycles of the moon. Astronomy can tell us a lot. What we perhaps didn't understand was that Indigenous Australians recognised a lot about astronomy and knew quite a bit. Dwayne Hamaker has written an article, Stories from the Sky, Astronomy in Indigenous Knowledge, and it, for me, was an eye-opener. Now, you may say, well, you ignorant old cow, you should have known that anyway, but I didn't, so we're going to welcome Dwayne to the program right now. Dwayne, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on. Now, what attracted you to the concept of looking at the question of what Indigenous Australians knew about the sky? Well, I had always been interested in astronomy since I was five, more Mm -hmm. of the scientific aspect. Mm -hmm. But I'd always had an interest in the cultural aspect as well. And, yeah, just trying to understand how different cultures understood and utilized the sky. So when I came to Australia and and found an opportunity to learn about people who've been here for 50 or 60,000 years or more, it seemed like a fantastic opportunity. Mm. You discovered the words of a Naranian elder. Is that what made you think, "Uh aha, maybe... There's something here. And what did he have to say? Yeah, it was really interesting. I mean, as I started to learn more about how Aboriginal people understood the sky, I learned that in the traditions, everything on the ground is reflected in the sky and that there is a supernatural element to it. But it's it's fantastic to look at how everything on the land is represented in the sky. So you, you can go back and forth between the land and the sky. Hmm. It's a very elegant phrase to say everything under creation is represented in the ground and in the sky. And I suppose that is why it is important. Now, what about Auntie Mavis Malbunka? What did she have to say? Well, she is a custodian of the Western Aranda people. And she tells the story of Norla, which is probably one of my favourite astronomical traditions. And she talks about a group of women who were dancing as stars in the Milky Way. And one of the women was carrying a baby, so she put him in a wooden basket and went on to continue dancing the ceremony. The baby in the basket fell off the Milky Way and came crashing to earth. They drove the rocks upwards. And the parents of the baby, the morning star and the evening star, continue to search for their lost child to this day. And if you look in the sky in the wintertime when the Milky Way is high above, you can see this arch of stars called Corona Australis, which is the southern crown, and that's the basket falling out of the Milky Way. Now, what's really fascinating about it is where the baby in the basket hit the ground and drove the rocks upward is a gigantic meteorite crater. That's called Norala, isn't it? The Aboriginal word is is Norala. It's huge. The whole crater itself is 22 kilometers wide, but the ring-shaped mountain range we see today is about 5 kilometers wide and about 150, 200 meters high. Now, Aboriginal people can use the stars. They do use them, noticing changes to predict seasonal change. Yes, this is really one of the complex areas where you try to understand how Aboriginal people and and Torres Strait Islander people as well utilize this, and you realize the the tremendous depth of knowledge they had to have amassed over thousands of years. It's fascinating. You You look at when stars rise, usually at sunset or just before sunrise, and it tells you all kinds of things about changing weather, when certain birds are building their nests, when the dingoes are breeding, when the orcas are migrating, the list just goes on and on. Yeah, it's very interesting. Apparently there's a star called the Big Dipper, otherwise known as Ursa Major, and that tells Torres Strait Islanders when they can plant or when they should plant sugar cane, sweet potato and banana. Right, the Big Dipper is what we call an asterism in astronomy. It's Mm. part of the constellation Ursa Major, so it's the seven brightest stars of Ursa Major, which in the Northern Hemisphere is the Big Bear. But in the Torres Strait, it's the shark, Bitem. Well, one of the things I thought was particularly interesting, what you say is that when the nose of this group of stars touches the horizon just after sunset, so there's a certain time during the season when that will happen, that just after sunset, the nose of Bitem will touch the horizon, then everyone knows that the shark breeding season's begun and, you know, not a good time to go swimming. Yeah, I experienced that firsthand when I was in the Torres Strait. <laughs> we went to Murr, which is Murray Island. Yeah, I've been there. Dropped our bags off at the lodge and walked down to the water, and in ankle-deep water, the sharks were just 
going back and forth a bit crazy. It was really phenomenal to see that up close and personal. Mm. And what about the uh, stellar scintillation, the twinkling of the stars as opposed to planets that apparently don't twinkle? Well, that was really interesting. I've seen this reported with the Torres Strait Islanders and in Vanuatu, so it seems to be something across Melanesia where you know the people would actually look at how much the stars twinkled, which in science terms we call scintillation. And based on how much they twinkled, they could determine you know, how much moisture was in the atmosphere. And then from that, they could determine what the weather was going to be like short-term and long-term seasonal change. And they distinguish planets from stars because the planets don't twinkle. This is a lot more than what you might describe as mere rudimentary knowledge, isn't it? It's a long-term understanding because the stars themselves over thousands of years sort of shift a bit. It's not the picture you see today in the sky. It's not the same as we might have seen 50,000 years ago. So they've passed down and had a long-term knowledge and understanding. Yes, exactly. I mean, the sky does change, you know, without going into too many gory details, but stellar proper motion and precession of the equinoxes, the sky is constantly changing. It does so very slowly. But that means that all of this collected knowledge has to change over time and that, you know, the Aboriginal people and the Islander people would, you know, develop new traditions and make new connections between seasonal change and navigation based on the positions of those stars at that time. Now, I can't say I like this woman's menu, but I do like the concept of the woman as hero. And you tell the story of Main Pan Kurik when there was a drought and food was very scarce and she set off. Can you tell us that story? Yes, so there was a great drought. This comes from Western Victoria, from the Wargaya people. Back in the Dreaming, there was a really bad drought, and there was no food sources available. And it was coming to about you know August, September, so late winter. And Marpy and Kirk went out to try to find food, and eventually came upon this large ant's nest, and she used her digging stick and pulled out these really big ant larvae, which were fantastic. They were nutritious, tasted great, went back, told everybody else, and they survived you know, that couple of months with that food source. She's a superwoman. Exactly. And then when she died, she went into the star as the star Arcturus. So when Arcturus rises, when the sun sets, that means these ant larvae are ready to be harvested. And a short time later, when it sets with the sun, or just behind the sun, that means they're no longer available. So there's only for that couple of month period, and around August, September, that those ant larvae are available as a food source. It's fascinating, really. Now, how does this knowledge compare, if you have done a study of this, with the knowledge of First Nation peoples in the United States and Canada? It's very similar. I mean, what you find around the world is all human cultures and societies developed calendars around the stars. So, you know, when the stars rose or set, the phases of the moon, you know, even the motions of the planets were all incorporated into these oral traditions. And they had a practical component for, like, navigation or calendars or you know, when to hunt, gather fish, plant crops. But they also had a social component, so when to hold ceremonies. I mean, it would be a, a law book in the stars, you know, and it informed totem structure and marriage classes. So it really was holistic in that sense. Mm, that's, that's fascinating. Now, have you heard of the story, is it the Seven Sisters? Yes, the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. There are stories about the Seven Sisters all around the world. And one of the really interesting things is most of the stories about the Seven Sisters tend to be very similar around the world. It's usually a a group of women, not always sisters, but usually sisters, being pursued by a man or a group of men in the constellation Orion. So the ancient Greek story about Orion chasing the Pleiades, you find similarities all around the world in many indigenous cultures. We don't really know why they're all the same. Is it that they're all from an original source, you know, tens of thousands of years ago? Or is it just that we as humans perceive things in a certain way? We don't know yet. Mm, That's fascinating, isn't it? That oceans away, people have got a similar description or narrative for what is happening in the sky or what that represents. But it apparently also tells the Pitjantjara people when the dingoes are going to be breeding. Yes, so when the Pleiades rise just before the sun comes up, for just a maybe 5 to 15 minutes before the sun comes up, 
that would tell them that not only the, the dingoes were breeding and the pups would be born soon, but that the winter was about to begin because the seven sisters were seen as ice maidens. And that's why they were blue and twinkly, sort of like frost. And that signified the coming of winter. And here on the east coast of Australia, it signified the coming of winter, the walta was beginning to bloom, and it told the people that the orca were going to be migrating northward. Well, when you add all this up, it's quite a complex range of stories and understanding and puts down, I would have thought, any belief that people might have that Indigenous Australians simply made up a few stories to explain how the stars looked as opposed to having a really complex understanding of what was happening. That is an unfortunate view, and we're getting over that view now, which is fantastic. But when you start to learn about these indigenous knowledge systems, you realize how incredibly complex they are. But we have to get over the idea that these are just sort of myths or legends or fairy tales, because they're not at all. And I think part of the reason for that is there are a lot of restrictions on some of this indigenous knowledge. I mean, they say knowledge is power, and that was exactly how it was in these cultures. So some of the knowledge is restricted to just men or women, which is why they call it men's business or women's business. And a lot of times, if you wanted to know the really deep stuff, you had to go through initiation. Now, there's stuff out there you can read about where elders have shared the complex information. But most of what the public hears about these dreaming stories are literally the kindergarten versions of it. So I think people mistakenly think that's all there is. Ah, and in reality, it's yeah. much, it, it'd be like reading the back of a novel in a bookstore and thinking that what you saw in the little paragraph on the back cover is the whole book. Well, it's not. Yes, no, I get it. I get it. What you're saying is that what we get to see and hear and read because someone's written about is largely not the full body of knowledge at all. It's in fact, as you say, the kindergarten version, the very simplistic version that's out there and that if we were Indigenous people and high up in the authority chain, we would have access to a much deeper group of facts, a much more complex knowledge than what we now know. Yes, you'd get to you know, see the rest of the iceberg, which we're just barely covering the tip of now. So what's the story about how many Indigenous people now would still have that knowledge? There are a lot of people who still have that, you know, a lot of damage did happen to these old traditions because of colonization and missionaries and disease and everything else, you know, stolen generations that we're all quite familiar with. But, you know, these traditions in many communities are still very strong. When I was in the Torres Strait, the islanders still look up every day to determine, you know, when to go fishing, when to plant the crops, when to do this, that, and the other. I mean, this isn't something that is relegated to the distant past. This is contemporary. Mm. Is there any chance that a number of these people will share for posterity, even if it's kept secret for many, many years, the depth of the knowledge they have so that we can get a better understanding of how much they know, not so much to steal their knowledge, but to be able to demonstrate to the rest of the world just how complex their knowledge structure is. Oh, yes. Elders have been doing this for quite some time. I've spoken with many elders who were very happy to share this information. And I've got a lot of colleagues, both indigenous and non-indigenous, who work with various communities and the traditional ecological knowledge. You know, astronomy is just one element of that. It's incredibly complex. And when the elders are sharing this information, we're able to put together, you know, for educational purposes, these fantastic calendars that link with the plants, the animals, the stars, the seasons, everything. So yes, there are a lot of elders who are sharing this information. Well, that's terrific, but it begs the question, why will they share it now, whereas in the past it wasn't shared, and that left us having, as you rightly describe it, the kindergarten version. Well, I think it's great there's been a change. It's terrific. Yeah, well, part of the problem has been trust, and there has been a long, unfortunate history of Indigenous knowledge being collected from a community and then used, and many times, against them without their consultation of, in mm -hmm. any way. So... There's been a long, unfortunate history of that, and now there are strict ethical guidelines so we can move forward properly and ethically. Well, that's a good thing. I mean, you can understand the lack of trust, how many times Indigenous people must have had bureaucrats, academics, do-gooders, missionaries, whatever, saying, I'm here to help you. And when they've gone, the Indigenous people don't feel any better off. In fact, probably in many cases have felt wor worse off. So we can understand, I can at least, the lack of trust. Dwayne, Stories from the Sky 
Astronomy in Indigenous Knowledge is a great article and I hope it opens up the minds of many of us to the great body of knowledge Indigenous Australians hold in this area. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Dr Dwayne Hamacher is a lecturer and ARC Research Fellow at Noorugili at the University of New South Wales. He's also the founder and chair for the Australian Society of Indigenous Astronomy and his article, Stories from the Sky, was published in The Conversation. Well, that's it for this week. Now, don't forget that if you'd like to hear all or any of today's program again, to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you're more than welcome to do so. Just go to abc.net.au slash rn and follow the prompts to CounterPoint. Well, thanks for your company today. I'm Amanda Vanstone, and until next week, Arrivederci.